Thank you. So my name is Deborah Gonzalez, and I'm the Government Affairs Director here at the Public Policy Institute of California, or PPIC. And we want to thank you for joining us here today. For those of you who are not familiar with PPIC, and I suspect many of you are, we're a nonprofit and nonpartisan think tank with offices in both Sacramento and San Francisco. For today's programs, we're going to learn the findings of a new PPIC report titled Stackable Credentials in Career Education at California Community Colleges, co-authored by Sarah Bone and Shannon McConaughey, both who are here today, and Bonnie Brooks, who also provided research support, is also here. Thanks, Bonnie. <laughs> So she didn't come just for the lunch. She really does really help us, but the lunch is usually really good. This research was supported with funding from the ECMC Foundation, the James Irvine Foundation, and the Sutton Family Fund. And we'd like to thank them for their support of this important work. We'd also like to thank ECMC Foundation for making today's lunch possible in the event. You should have received a copy of the report on your chair. There are additional copies in the back of the room. And the report, the technical appendix, and the slides that uh, Shannon is going to show today are now available on our website at ppic.org. Shannon will be presenting today. And after her talk, you will have plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, we, like, uh, we, like, we record these things, uh, so I can't make too much fun of my husband, because uh, he can see it on tape, I've been told. but. Um, <laughs> They, we will have microphones when you ask a question, so, so please wait for those microphones to come so that the audience can hear uh, your question. A couple of things. Later today, we'll have a short survey. It's an email survey. I know it's election time and surveys are kind of scary, um, but this is a nice one, so please take this survey. We really appreciate it. And please turn off and silence your cell phones. Career technical education in California has undergone a significant transformation in recent years. This transformation at the K-12 level and as at the community college level has been the result of the adoption of the LCFF formula and other funding changes. The financing scheme aside, the essential goal remains the same. The state has a vested interest in CTE programs will result in better prepared workforce and that our economy will benefit over time. The student has an interest in their economic mobility, in getting a better job, advancing up the career ladder in their chosen field. For students to take these courses comes at a price. They are either taking away time from the labor market or away from their families. As someone who worked full time during the day and went to school at night with very small children, part of me appreciated handing that screaming child to my husband. Again, this is on tape. Um, sorry, honey, um, but it's true. But seriously, the sacrifice students make to take and pursue courses, CTE courses, is significant. The time away from their family and their job is difficult and sometimes very costly. And the longer the process is, the more difficult and the more costly. The essential question PPIC in the Chancellor's Office continues to ask is, is it worth it? And if it's worth it, are there ways to streamline the process that students in the state can reap the benefits of these programs more efficiently? I'm happy to say this is the first of two reports looking at high value stackable credentials, and our next report will link wage outcomes. Very excited about this report, so stay tuned. I want to thank the Chancellor's Office and EDD for their commitment to looking at these programs with an eye in approving outcomes. We could not do this work without your partnership. I'd now like to introduce Shannon McConaughey. Shannon McConaughey is a senior research associate at PPIC. Her research interests include health access, healthcare access, utilization and outcomes among vulnerable populations, and the impact of vocational training programs on economic mobility. Welcome, Shannon. Thanks, Deborah. Yeah. And thank you. Um, I, I wanted to just acknowledge the um, Chancellor's Office again, um, really without their support and willingness to provide us with access to longitudinal student level data, this work just wouldn't be possible. So again, a, a big thank you to, to the Chancellor's Office and their staff who have assisted us with this work. Um, and so we'll start, and, and actually Deborah laid out a lot of the reasons why we are interested in career education. Um, so career education programs, sometimes you'll hear them referred to as vocational education, vocational training. In, I feel like, earlier iterations, it was career technical education, CTE, but th this is all the same thing. So these are, these are education programs that are designed, oh, here we go, that are designed to provide students with industry or occupation-specific skills in order to connect people with jobs. Um, 
They're also key to meeting state, state workforce needs. Um, and they also, as, as Deborah mentioned, can really serve as an important tool to provide a route, we hope, to improved employment opportunities, to improved economic opportunities and economic mobility. And this is particularly true for students who don't pursue a four-year college degree. Um, the California Community College System is the primary provider of career education programs in the state. They serve a very diverse group of students in these programs, everyone from recent high school graduates uh, to stranded workers who are looking for a foothold in the labor market to people who are seeking additional training in order to advance in their current jobs. Um, I'll note here that while for-profit institutions are also a provider of career education, um, the enrollments and credentials they confer in California have really dropped in, in recent years. Over the past about seven years, they've declined by almost 50%. Um, uh, the state in, in, in recent years also has made very large investments, as, as Deborah mentioned, in career education. Um, more than $1 billion has been invested since about 2014. This has been in the Career Pathways Trust, also CTE incentive grants. And finally, the Strong Workforce Program is a source of ongoing annual support uh, for the community colleges to really expand, improve, and develop additional um, career education, but career pathways. And so what do we mean when we talk about career pathways? Um, these can really incorporate a lot of, of different sorts of features, but the common thing is they refer to kind of a clear sequence of, say, of education, of on-the-job training, or, or different types of training, um, and related services and supports that, kind of, that, that really are focused on students being able to meet their career goals. And so the focus of this work, stackable credentials, is, is one way we can really think about operationalizing this idea of career pathways. And so, you know, stackable credentials, uh, what we're studying here is um, students are provided a, a fairly clear route where they can build uh, skills, competencies, and additional credentials over time that really signal this accumulation of, of career-based um, skills. Um, the key idea being in, in, in that they're stackable is that um, students initially complete a, a career education credential. Oftentimes, this is a short-term certificate, so something that can be, be completed in a relatively short period of time. They can enter the labor market, get connected to a job, and then return to college with that uh, original or, or initial coursework and credential um, counting towards kind of this next step on this rung or on this pathway. Um, with the idea being that, you know, hopefully this next step is along this career trajectory. And what we really want to see is that these steps lead to um, higher level positions and, and hopefully higher paying jobs. Um, some of the key features of, of stackable pathways or stackable credential pathways are really that they're well mapped out, that the sequence of credentials that are connected and kind of signify this path are, are well telegraphed to students, and that it's clear how you can progress through coursework and, and, and these multiple credentials that, again, are interconnected and kind of build on this skill set. Um, also, ideally, they can be, they're segmented in such a way that students have multiple um, entry points. So they can earn a credential, they can leave and go, to, uh, go into the labor market, but then they can return. So they're, they're kind of clearly defined entry and exit points is what we call them, where you can, again, go to the labor market, come back to college, earn an additional credential, enter the labor market, and that sort of thing. So that's another kind of key feature when we think about um, kind of well-defined um, credentials. Um, and, and the last thing I'll note here is that kind of stackable credential pathways are also related to um, some ongoing initiatives within the community college system. Um, so guided pathways is, is being implemented uh, system-wide right now. Um, and guided pathways is really focused on helping students kind of understand why they are in school, what their ultimate goal is, and then mapping out that path of how they can get to typically that career goal. Um, so in that way, Stackable Credential Pathways kind of feeds that. Um, in addition, the development of the new online college. Um, one of the things in the, its early implementation is to develop some short-term career education credentials that can then possibly be expanded at brick and mortar campuses to, to um, to complete additional additional credentials. Um, so it's in, in that way it does relate to some other ongoing efforts within within the system. And so still, even, even despite kind of this, this uh, the promise or the potential of stackable credentials, we actually have a pretty limited evidence base as to how colleges structure pathway programs and, and more importantly, 
how often students complete them and maybe what factors are related to um, having students more easily complete a stackable pathway. And that really is what we were trying to get at with this work. Um, we do have some prom promising evidence um, from earlier work we did where we were focused on health career education programs within the community college system. And again, this work was, was promising in the sense that when we looked at students who initially earned a short-term um, health credential, uh, when they returned to complete a longer, a longer term health credential, um, they did see earnings gains. And actually, over a period of time, their quarterly earnings caught up with students who initially earned uh, you know, that single high value credential right off the bat. So that's, that's exactly what we're hoping for. Um, that said, in the health space, we found that kind of very few pathways existed, or rather that they all led in one to, to one place, and that was to register nursing degrees or associate's degrees in nursing, um, which on the one hand is, is good both because nursing is you know a key a large occupation uh, within the state where we do have you know significant workforce needs it also is one if not the highest kind of value credential that's available within the community college system so um, what we wanted to do with this work is really expand to other career education programs the community college system offers a wide range of ca career education training and so with this work we're extending kind of our, our examination of stackable credentials and these training pathways to kind of this broader group of career education programs. And so um, here we're looking at, um, specifically, we focus predominantly on five different um, career education programs. Those include uh, information technology. So these are things like networking, IT technicians, um, management information systems, uh, family and consumer sciences. This is where uh, training for um, early childhood educators, preschool teachers. It also includes culinary arts, hotel and food management. Um, also the business, uh, business career education. Here there are things related to real estate and accounting and, and things in the, in the business space, small, small businesses. Um, engineering is another broad group. Um, this encompasses everything from automotive technology to to different construction trades. Um, and finally, public and protective services. And this is um, training related to being in kind of law enforcement, probation officers, security guards, but different things. So these are kind of these five broad disciplines in career education offered um, in the community college system. And I, I will note that these five, along with health, comprise about 90% of all of the career education credentials we see conferred by the community college system. So we're, we're really trying to cover a, a lot of the ground of, of what's going on um, in the career education space. So a, a quick overview of the presentation. Um, I'm first going to just provide an overview of career education students, again with this focus on students who initially earn a short-term certificate. Um, next I'll lay out um, two different types or structures of stackable credential pathways um, and discuss how uh, certain unique features that, that we identified. Um, and then finally we'll turn to our findings that really look at how these stackable credential features are related to the student outcomes we observe and the likelihood in the in the chances that a student does go on to stack a credential from a short-term certificate and we'll, we'll conclude with a brief summary. So here what we see um, is kind of over the past decade these are students who have earned career education um, credentials within the community college system. Um, Enrollment in career education has remained relatively steady at about 300,000 um, students each year. Um, but we have seen an uptick in the number of first-time students earning career education credentials. So that orange line on the top is the total number of career education um, credentials that are conferred. And then the other three lines um, represent the different levels of awards that people earn in this space. And so you see the largest uptick is, is with um, associate degrees. That's the, that's the blue line. Um, some of the growth we see there may be related to um, the state, I believe it was in 2005, started a nursing education initiative to really grow their RN programs, and that was successful, so that might be responsible for some of that uptick. Um, the, the lighter blue line are these short-term certificates. Mm. 
excuse me, and we do see that um, kind of over the past five years, there's been about a 10% increase in the number of students who initially complete a short-term credential, um, which translates in, in, into about 15,000 students in each of the last few years earning a short-term uh, certificate in a career education field. Um, and you know what I realized too, um, so we do define, we do have some technical definitions for short-term certificates. So short-term certificates are those that can be completed or are designed to be completed in less than one year. So these are certificates that take anywhere as, as few as six units to earn a certificate uh, uh, to as many as 29 units. So again, it's a kind of this, this one year period. Um, and then we see uh, the, the purple line are long-term certificates. These are those that take um, more than a year, but less than two years. So a little bit less than that associate degree, which are tend to be a full-time two-year two -year programs in terms of degree requirements. And so I've mentioned this a few times now, but we're really focusing predominantly on those students, that group of students who is completing a short-term certificate um, as their first credential. And we do this for a few different reasons. Uh, first, many students start there, right? We, have, we find about four in 10 students start and their first credential within the community college system is a short-term career education certificate. Um, these students tend to be older relative to students who initially earn an associate degree. Almost half are age 30 or older when they complete that first credential. Um, and the vast majority, about 80%, have a high school education or less prior to tr prior to completing that that first credential um, and the other reason is there are, that you know there are some concerns amongst whether practitioners or policymakers that offering short-term certificates might deter students and this would be especially a concern say for disadvantaged student groups if this is the opportunity and this and you stop at a short-term certificate rather than pursuing additional post-secondary education and the reason why this is a concern is the, you know, the evidence that we do have on the returns to career education credentials, broadly speaking, uh, shows us that short-term certificates tend to confer either low value or no value. And so, so what that means is that upon completion and then entering the labor market, students really are doing maybe only a little bit better or no better than they would if they had never completed that credential. And so, you know, this raises concerns if students only are earning short-term credentials, um, what that means kind of for their career trajectories and their, you know, their opportunities for economic mobility. Um, and yeah, and so it, it really is this, this idea of this is the group for which there's the most room for improvement in, in, um, in improving kind of economic outcomes, employment outcomes, and, and career, career growth. And so that's why, that's why we focus them. So um, here what we're doing is, ooh. That's interesting. Um, we're showing the three-year trajectories of the nearly 200,000 students who earned short-term certificates between school years 2000 and 2001 and school years 2013-14. The reason we stop at 2013-14, we want to be able to follow all students for at least three years from the time they completed that first short-term career education credential. And so, although some of the numbers are missing here, uh, I can, oh, and the legend. is. That nice. Uh, nope. Okay. Um, it's not a problem, but we can we can talk through it. So what we find is the vast majority of students who initially earn a short term certificate uh, return to continue their post secondary education. So the orange, which is the only one we see, that thirty five percent. Those are students who within three years stop after that first credential and we do not observe them in, in the community college or transferring to a four-year college. So we're saying they stopped after that first credential, likely entered the labor force, and, and that was it. Um, we find another one-third return to the community college system after that first credential within three years to complete and uh, to enroll and complete additional coursework. Um, we find just under, so that's that blue, so that's about 33%. The kind of lighter blue section is about 23%, and those are students who re-enroll and do complete an additional credential, so may be stacking along a pathway. Um, we'll, we'll get more clear on that in, in kind of the later section of this, of this uh, presentation. And then just under 10% go on to a four-year, um, transfer to a four-year college, which, again, within three years of completing that short-term career education certificate. To, uh, degree. And so, you know, what this signals to us is that a large share of students 
do seem to have some intention to pursue additional post-secondary training. Um, and so it, it, that really underscores the need for institutions and policymakers to try to understand how best to support these students to be successful in completing their, their goals, which, which seem, again, we don't know that they're all coming back to stack credentials, but it does seem that re-engaging with post-secondary education is something that a lot of these students do, do want to do. Okay, so now we'll move on to a, the, our discussion of kind of these stackable pathway designs. Um, and so when we started this work, uh, we weren't sure exactly how we were going to identify, you know, career education programs necessarily, or, and more specifically, really understand how, how programs and pathways are designed to promote stackability, right? And, you know, while we have this really wonderful, rich, student level longitudinal data available through the chancellor's office, it doesn't provide us with much insight into the way career education programs are structured across the 114 community colleges in the state, nor across the different career education programs. And so for us to kind of do the type of analysis we wanted, we really needed some systematic way to, to classify or categorize what a pathway looked like, what features it had, and then have the ability to link that to student level data. And so what we, I shouldn't say quickly, but what we came to realize is what we needed to do was um, go to the course catalog, college course catalogs and websites. Um, we did a detailed scan of those course catalogs, um, looking at each of these five uh, career education programs. I will say we didn't scan all 114 uh, colleges. Um, rather, we kind of, we developed a system where we wanted to um, target colleges that seem to have different levels of credentials available within that career education discipline. So have some mix of short-term, long-term, and associate degrees, which would signal that there was potential to stack. Um, and then we also endeavored to capture colleges that conferred cumulatively about half of all the career education credentials that were conferred within each of those five career education programs and or you know disciplines that I, that I talked about earlier. Um, this resulted in a scanning between about 25 and 30 colleges in each of our five different areas. And what we were looking for really is we were looking at within a program, the different credentials that were offered, what that coursework looked like, and which ones seemed like they were related or linked in some way. Um, and, and, you know, and then what we did was we, we, uh, we kind of relied on technical assistance and toolkits um, that are really designed to um, help local and state workforce and education agencies lay out different kind of pathways because we were trying to think about what features that we could, we could identify and flag kind of consistently could be related. And so from those resources, we, um, we kind of laid out two different types of, of pathways. Uh, one type is a progressive pathway, um, and this is where students can upgrade lower level credentials to higher level credentials um, with the uh, additional with additional coursework in the same program and I'm going to provide some examples so hopefully that will become more clear um, at a progressive pathway you can think of as kind of that ladder right each each credential is kind of another rung and you're moving up in terms of the skills um, we also the other type of pathway is a lattice pathway um, where students complete say a core set of courses sometimes referred to as a launch pad and that core set of courses can lead them to multiple different credentials which may be of the same length um, and that can also be, be upgraded as well. So in that way, the lattice kind of has features that are both horizontal and vertical, whereas the progressive pathway really is more of this vertical progression in terms of, of, um, of what, you can, what, what credentials you can complete. And so kind of based on this, uh, we developed this pathways database or this program uh, database that included information on about 550 different, different programs. And I'll say that 550 is specific to the college and the, and the program. So there, the, you know, there's overlap um, there. And um, so then just to lay out uh, kind of more clearly, so this is an example of a progressive pathway that we identified in our scan. Um, 
And uh, so it lays out an explicit progressive pathway in the information technology area. And so what you can see is um, students can earn an 11 unit certificate as an application specialist certificate. And so this is you know, signaling a basic level of proficiency with certain software applications. The student can then enter the labor market, get a job, or they can go on to, you know, and then either return or, or complete the second, uh, you know, two additional certificates. Um, that kind of expand to incorporate other software applications, a deeper knowledge, and, and signal kind of this higher proficiency level. Um, and the other thing I'll point out to you here too is this is what we consider an explicit pathway in that the like the the titles of the of the credentials show that they're linked. You go from a application specialist to an application expert to an application master, and the coursework is well laid out so that you can see kind of each of those. And so this is what we think of when we think of as a, an explicit <laughs> progressive pathway. Um, and so here's where we, you know, I, I mentioned that we did these catalog scans and we were trying to identify particular features of these pathways. So for progressive pathways, we kind of came up with three different criteria to categorize whether a program looked like this or had certain features of a progressive pathway or not. Um, and so the kind of the broadest definition or the, the broadest question we asked um, with progressive pathways was, are there short-term credentials that can be upgraded to any higher level credentials? Um, and what we found was about 80% of programs did have this fairly broad feature. Although in this category, some of those 80%, it was that you got a, a certificate in a career education space, you then completed your general ed requirements, and that became an associate degree. And so in some ways that wasn't necessarily the traditional notion of like, completing additional um, skills or competencies within the, the career education space um, in what we kind of conceive of as stackable credentials. But it's still an important thing, and obviously associate's degrees kind of can, can provide educational mobility where you can then transfer to a four-year college. Um, so then, so that was one of the flags, and again, that was the most common feature that we found. Um, the, the second kind of feature in the progressive pathways was, are there what we call certificate-only pathways, but can short-term certificates be upgraded to longer-term certificates? So that example that I showed you just previously is a good example of certificates that build on each other, although there isn't necessarily an associate degree that's, that's related to this path. Um, and then finally, is the path made explicit? And by explicit, is it well defined? So we saw there that the the names of the thing of the of the credentials signaled that they were connected and part of a sequence. Um, in some cases, the description of the program will tell you, "Ooh, first do this." then you can do this, then you can do that. So we were looking in those course catalogs. We also scanned websites to see if additional information was there for all of these. But was there a way that, that, was, that the student got a signal that, hey, this is, these credentials are connected and part of a path? Um, we see very few, um, very few programs have these explicit pathways. Um, I'll note here, because I realize I didn't earlier, the scans of catalogs that we did were for the 2016-17 school year. Um, we, we use those for, all, for our entire scan. So it's quite possible that things are evolving. Again, there are these other initiatives, um, and a lot is happening within the community college system. So the, these, these numbers may be different. I'd also just say that they're not necessarily representative of all career education programs, but rather those that are included in, in our scan of programs. Um, oh, the, the only other thing I'd mention is there are some differences, and you can find those in the report across the different career education disciplines, so business versus things. So we have these distributions across each of those five large, large areas, and you can see that in the report. And so then we move on to lattice pathways, which are slightly less common, but hopefully this, this is an example of a lattice pathway in, in, an, edu in an engineering field um, that's based on renewable energy. And so what we see here, students can complete, a, it's called an en engineering technology fundamental certificate, and that certificate can lead you to multiple additional credentials of a, a, or certificates of um, the same level in energy efficiency or different types of solar installation. And then those can, again, be upgraded to associate's degrees in each of that. But the key feature here is that there is this core launch pad that leads to multiple other credentials. Um, and so when we look at the, our, the, our features or these criteria that we, that we identified from the scan, um, 
so again, there are three criteria. And the first is, are there three or more degrees and certificates that share a core group, uh, which we defined as two, uh, two or more courses? Um, of, uh, are there three credentials that have this core group of courses kind of embedded within them? We found almost half of programs had something like this, right? Um, then we asked, is this shared group of courses explicitly called out as a core or launch pad? So, you know, is it signaled to the student that, hey, if you complete this, say, six units or nine units, then you can go on here or here or here. We find much fewer had this explicitly defined launch pad, only about 6%. And then we asked, does the launch pad itself confer a certificate, um, which we saw in that previous example, only about 3% of um, programs had that feature. Um, and so, those are kind of the features that, that we identified. And so, again, when I was talking about when we developed this, this database and these other things, our real goal was to find some way that we could then connect this to the student outcomes that we, that we actually observe. Um, and we were able to do that. So the, the community college system does have um, information on all of the awards that students earn. There are markers of what level of award it was. So was it, you know, six, uni six to 12 units or, you know, so we can put them in these short-term, long-term associate degree buckets. Um, and there are signifiers that do give you kind of a broad sense of what program they're in and so based on that information and the way we configured our scan we were able to merge these features onto that student level student level data um, and what we did here is we we ran statistical models where we were able to control for a variety of different factors student level demographics um, different markers of disadvantage or um, measures of ability. So uh, in order to kind of isolate the relationships between we, you know, what we saw on the pathway features versus kind of how different students sort may sort into different programs and just try to get a sense of, of what was going on. Um, the last thing I'll note is that in this portion of the analysis, we're, we're only focused on students um, that completed short-term certificates between the school years 2009, 2010, and school years 2013-14, so just that five-year period. And again, that's really related to the fact that we were scanning 2016-17 courses, and so we wanted to be more proximate to the information that we had gathered about pathway features. Um, I will say we, we ran several of the models with different time frames, and it really doesn't change our conclusions. But th that's where our, you know, this, this part of the analysis is focused um, just on that, that group of students. And so first, we just start looking at the share of students, again, who initially earned that short-term certificate, who went on to stack another credential along one of these paths that we, that we identified. And this is all within a three-year period. And so what we can, oh, sorry. Uh, what we can see here is that in most cases, uh, regardless of sex, race, ethnicity, or age, um, there aren't large differences. About 20 to around 23% of students who initially complete a short-term certificate go on to what we call stack another, another credential, again, within the community college system. Um, there are some larger differences across fields of study. So students who initially start with a short-term certificate in business seem to be less likely to stack relative to, say, those that are in family and consumer sciences or, or other areas. Um, and then, oh, that's what I also, and in each of these cases, we've actually adjusted all of these shares based, again, on this variety of student characteristics. So for all of the models, we're controlling for the age of the student in the first term, their race, ethnicity, um, receipt of CalWORKs, which is the cash assistance program in California, or Pell Grants, both as signals of, say, lower economic um, or economic disadvantage, um, average GPA in the two-year period prior to completing, so kind of trying to get at markers of ability, whether the student had ever been enrolled in developmental education programs. So we've kind of adjusted the likely or the, the share of students who stack um, controlling for all of those characteristics, and this is what we find. Um, and so, but what we really, you know, what our focus really is about is whether these pathway features that we identified, if we see a relationship between the design and the odds that a student stacks a credential on a path. And so this now, these results add on to those models that controlled for those whole, that whole host of kind of individual level factors and include the pathway features that we just, that we just walked through. Um, 
And so what you're seeing here, this figure is showing the increase in the odds of a student stacking in a program if that program had an explicit pathway design. And so remember, explicit for progressive is, is it well defined, you know, whether that's, you know, intermediate, advanced in the credentials, or for the lattice, is that core course, are those core courses clearly identified as either a core or a launch pad or something like that. So, these bars show the increased likelihood relative to students that were enrolled in an explicit pathway. Um, and what we found was we found pretty convincing relationships um, between pathways that were designed to be stackable and the chances that students stacked. And, and in actuality, as we move down, um, so a student in a program with an explicitly stackable pathway is relative to a student that maybe was in a program that only had minimal stackable features is 10 percentage points more likely to, to stack a credential along a path. And compared to students who are in a program that had no type of stackable feature are 16 percentage points more, more likely to stack. Um, and what I what I draw your attention to there is that these are much larger than those differences that we saw across a lot of the, the demographic characteristics, right? Those were in the two to three percentage point range. You know, some of these are in the 10 to 16 percentage point range. So we really do feel like this, this association between features and the likelihood that a student does stack a credential within a three year period are, are pretty strong relationships. Uh, and, and finally, um, here we're looking separately across these different groups, so we're running separate models which allow for kind of these different characteristics and pathway features to have different impacts on the likelihood across these different groups. Um, and so what we found that for men and women, the, the kind of bump that, uh, that a man or a woman gets from being an explicitly defined pathway is, a, is very similar. It's about three to four percentage points. Um, we find similar sized effects for white students when they're enrolled in an explicit pathway versus kind of very limited pathway features. Um, we find a larger impact for Asian students, and then more importantly, we found the largest impact for Latino students. Um, so Latino students in career education programs with these well-defined explicit um, connections between related credentials had an eight percentage point increase in the likelihood that they stacked a credential along a pathway. Um, and and this, is, this is an important finding, we think, um, especially given the kind of persistent achievement gaps for Latino students, but also because um, you know, if we're able to kind of have these better developed um, stackable pathways that could really improve some of the, the earnings. And we, we see relatively high poverty rates amongst um, working Latinos. And so if, if th these training programs can kind of be more focused on moving them along a pathway, that could, that could really go a long way. And so kind of to wrap up, um, what we found is we, you know, it's, there does seem to be room to improve um, credentials, stackable credential pathways for these students who earn short-term certificates. Um, nearly two-thirds of students who do earn a short-term credential return to complete additional post-secondary education, um, which really signals kind of this, this desire or intent to try to upskill. Um, and so it's really important that instit institutions try to think about how we can best support those students. Um, Again, we found that students in programs with explicitly defined stackable credential programs had larger increases in the odds that they did stack them, um, and that that bump in completion was far greater than those differences we observed across certain de demographic groups. Um, but we also found that few programs seem to offer or explicitly define these stackable credential pathways, suggesting, again, that there's, there's room to kind of expand on this. Um, and again, it may be that with implementation of guided pathways and some of these other initiatives that this is currently evolving. Um, and so it'll be important for us to kind of think about that as we keep, as we keep working in this space to understand kind of what's going on. Um, and then finally, Oh, did I do this again? I'm so sorry. Um, well, we find you know convincing relationships between program design um, and the odds that students stack credentials. What's perhaps even more important, and as Deborah mentioned, is it's important to ensure that these additional credentials are valued by employers and confer kind of that path to higher level jobs, higher level earnings, and and kind of offer uh, over time. Um, I improvement in, in outcomes. And so that will be the focus of the next report in this series, which I believe is scheduled to come out somewhere in the, the summer or fall of next year. And so kind of that's the next extension, because that really is what we expect or hope for. That's the purpose of these, um, is to lead to these higher paying jobs. 
And with that, I will end and um, ask if anyone has any questions. And if you do have questions, if you could please uh, wait until the microphone comes around. I think Alexa and Kelly maybe both have microphones. Yes, hi. I was wondering, um, yes, you have the stackable credentials up there. Are they industry credentials like AWS, mm -hmm. OSHA, or are they credentials created by the colleges? Yeah. And if they are created by the colleges, are they equal through all the campuses? So if a student is in the Bay Area and moves to LA, they can pick up their education or do they have to start over? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, these, when we're referring to credentials, we are referring to the credentials created within the college and within the program. I will say that some pathways, and actually um, in the information and communications technology field, they have developed some, they call them branded pathways that are, they're trying to help colleges across the system find these ways, and those are tied to industry certifications within the IT sector. So there, um, I think it, it varies across the different disciplines. I think the level of certification is different, right? And so I do, you know, in the information technology sector, there are several kind of third party industry credentials that can be achieved. And I know, again, people are trying to build those in so that if you complete this, you will get this community college credential, but you're also set up to then pass the certification and receive the, you know, a plus tech specialist or something like that. So I think it's a really important point and, and kind of these paths should be, you know, if, if they're designed well, should be able to incorporate those, those industry certifications within them. Hi, uh, looking at your data, how did you, um, or how did the data look at skill builders? Those would be students that came to the college to get, they're already employed, right. so they get a certificate to keep their job or to get a better job, and then did you include non-credit CTE certificates in your study as well? So I will say our study only focuses on those that we start with the group of students who earn a community college credential, and as I understand skill builders, they are students who may complete a course or two, but don't actually complete an award within the community college system, so they are not included in this analysis. Um, Remind me the second part of your question. Non-credit, we didn't include non-credit certificates, but I do think that they are they are component um, to or a potential component to these to these pathways. But no, those weren't included. I'm thinking of these uh, in terms of the um, the reporting that you all did at the healthcare report mm -hmm. in this uh, stackability uh -huh. there. And I just wanted to ask uh, how you'd suggest um, we sort of do further reading, but also how you compared this to um, the higher unit awards by themselves, in other words, in the absence of stackability. Because if I remember correctly from the healthcare report, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that most uh, students will not go on as here to get um, uh, a, a larger unit certificate, and so that had significant impacts on their earnings in the long in the long run. Right. Uh, I, I, yes, I am. So in that health report, we hadn't necessarily mapped out kind of these. We we weren't as focused on kind of mapping out these types, and and didn't as explicitly go through and systematically kind of use these criteria. That said, the paths that we did map out in that health. Um, they were progressive paths mostly. We had a group of, I think, and, and in that piece, we really looked at what the data showed us, like what we saw students actually doing. When we moved kind of to this broader group of students, there was so much variability in kind of what students did that that approach didn't really work, which is why we moved to the scan. Um, but you're right, we did see in that we had, you know, maybe three short-term certificates that we looked at that were kind of the big group of who earned those and then saw long -term, a long-term certificate, usually an LVN, to a registered nursing. Um, yeah, I don't know that I answered your question, but it's a good... Did you have any insights you would want to... Sarah? I would just... Oh, thank you. Violating my own rules. 
Um, I would just add that I think one similarity across the health research and this is that in both cases, a lot of students do seem to return and enroll in additional coursework in the area, um, but a few, but relatively few complete an additional certificate. Um, and that I think is one common feature that we see across um, kind of all of these students who start in career education programs. I, and just really quickly, I think what's behind the question is asking what's the value of the short term mm -hmm. certificate by itself as opposed right. to just, you know, encouraging them to get in uh, to the longer credential. Right. And I can say, at least based on the health work, the, the say the wage return to most of the short term certificates was quite negligible if, if non-existent. Um, so for that group of students who only complete or the uh, certified nursing assistant or a home health aid certificate, those convert, conferred relatively small, again, or no uh, seeming labor market value. Um, but when those students returned they and, and completed these kind of higher level credentials, um, they did see that bump. I mean, that's a really important thing to think about with this work. We know from other, there's a fair number of research articles that have tried to get it kind of quantifying what the return is to different types of career education credentials. Most of that is pretty consistent in that short-term certificates confer kind of the lowest value, although that does vary across field. So I will say this in our work before in like public and protective services, short term certificates for men actually give folks a pretty big bump in in earnings relative to what we would have observed them earning in the absence of completing that. So, you know, we're we really feel like this. The next piece of this work is a key you know, second part, because you're right, we need to, perhaps a short term is, is all you need in certain spaces and students should stop there. But we think there's enough uh, evidence or enough um, promise in earning higher level things that we want to explore where those high value paths are. So thank you for your research and presenting today. Really exciting to see the opportunity that these uh, pathways have, particularly on that last slide for uh, students of color. Um, so my question is around uh, maybe the next step in the pipeline and the stackability mm -hmm. of associate degrees for transfer, mm -hmm. and if that's something you'd considered or looked at in pathways that have an associate degree as kind of a terminal stop, and how we could perhaps build that in, knowing yeah. that students on that ADT pathway are much more likely to complete within two years um, if they do transfer. Yep. Uh, these are such good questions, and I feel like that one in particular, that I had a note in my in my slides that to comment on that, and it just kind of got passed over. Yeah, you know, we, all of our paths obviously are stopping at the associate degree level. Some of that is related to our data constraints. We are not able to connect students from community colleges to our four-year colleges. We do have, again, flags that tell us whether a student transferred to a four-year college, but beyond that, we don't, we can't observe them right so so in that part it's kind of necessitated by that constraint um, but it's an important point and one you know career education doesn't necessarily say students don't have opportunities in four-year colleges and it's and it's true we see in the community colleges expanding to include um, four-year credentials in some career education so I think as this um, research agenda evolves we do want to think about what that looks like if we're able to start matching or you know have information from some of the four-year colleges in the state and can kind of track students I think that would be powerful um, also as community colleges start um, having more students completing um, the four-year degree within the community college, the applied bachelors, right? Um, it'll be important to see how that can get incorporated into, into these pathways. Um, but yeah, we, you know, if, if we could have, we would have liked to kind of continue and watch students kind of keep moving up. But um, it's also the case that with, with this work, we did really want to focus on what can be done for students who say never pursue a four-year college degree. Um, even though that's a you know a goal that I think with the associate degrees of transfer we're really trying to promote, knowing kind of what a four-year college degree does do for people in terms of their labor market opportunities, but there still seems to be a fairly large group of of people who who kind of have a high school education, and so trying what we can do to better connect them to kind of career advancement, the middle skills jobs, those sorts of things. Hi, Hi. I'm Paula Lee. Uh, you may have covered this in your health report. I didn't see it. But uh, my question is about this huge workforce need in the area of uh, uh, addiction treatment. Mm -hmm. And 
drug and alcohol counselors. There's a huge need, and, it, and the education needs to go beyond, you know, just the lived experience, mm -hmm. because it's gotten so much more complicated with medically assisted treatment, etc. Mm -hmm. So I know that in community colleges there are addiction mm -hmm. studies programs, but mm -hmm. it doesn't seem that there's enough in there that, that gap between high school and um, this career education that you're talking about before mm -hmm. they get to the AA that's just the perfect place where that uh, higher education uh, could be achieved right um, I think that's a great point and so I you know I will say that the community colleges the chancellor's office the the districts they 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 engage quite a bit with regional employers they try to understand what the labor market demands are for their for their regions and kind of develop their programs in response um, I, I think in the space of, say, addiction specialists or there, there are psych technicians who are just kind of trained within these, these um, kind of in broad ways in which to assist people who may either have mental health conditions or substance use disorders. Um, you know, and as we've expanded, say, Medicaid and these other things, I think the opportunities to provide those services to folks with these issues has really grown as well, which in turn really grows our workforce needs in that space. So I think that's a good point. Um, you know, and to the extent that, you know, the, the workforce and economic um, development divisions, they, they do try to really try to understand where the... Um, projected employment uh, gaps are and, and, you know, craft their programs. But, you know, I'm sure there are ways in which they could, they could improve on that, on that process. That's something I, I work more in health rather than higher education. And I will say that's something that I noticed as well. Um, and kind of think about with all of these, you know, with Medicaid expansion and these different programs that are really trying to target that group, we do need, we do need more training in this space. So I think that's a great point. Hi. Uh, in your research oh, exploring go. different college uh, catalogs, did you come across a college that recognized a credential with less than six units or recognizing a specific class? So I will say this. Let's see. Let me make sure I get this correct. So in our work, we do include, sometimes they're called local certificates, but these are non-chancellor approved credentials. Those are between, I believe, six and 17 units. And those were a pretty big group of credentials when we look in the short term space, although in recent years, um, the chancellor's office has kind of acknowledged, and those tend to be created by districts. They're really, they're not on the transcript. They're really, uh, they can be, I think, kind of moved around but within the colleges that may be in that district, but beyond that, there isn't kind of this thing, but they're, they're intended to respond to some very probably specific local labor market needs or say uh, a specific employer in that region needs, you know, this amount of training, and so they've developed a local certificate. So we include include those those certificates um, I don't there there may be things there actually may be awards that we do observe that are below six units but we don't we don't include those um, whether there are opportunities for those to be kind of meaningful in terms of conveying skills and, and offering labor market value I'm, I'm not sure yes hi I'm, I'm interested I have several questions okay. but one one question that I had was um, in terms of completion rates, mm -hmm. did it make a difference if, if the program was maybe employer sponsored? Mm -hmm. So in other words, mm -hmm. if employers were actually encouraging their employees to take um, even a foundational class mm -hmm. or, or maybe a series of classes, did that help to assist these employees to complete? So that's kind of one question. Well, I, so I, it's a great question, and we, we don't know that. We don't see that. I will say we are, again, hoping to do more work in this space, and one of the, one of the kind of future pieces of work, in addition to kind of these, these wages, is how do students return to, to do a stackable pathway? And we're very focused on the role that employers would play. Um, so there are some resources where we hope we might be able to get at that information. Um, but no, it's, it's a great point and one that we want to kind of explore more deeply, but that's not reflected. Um, the, the data that we have is really that, that, that what's collected within the community college system. Um, and so we don't know to what extent employers are play, pay, playing the role of having students, you know, come back or, or, fin or, you know, complete a credential in order to kind of keep a job or advance in a job. Right. Okay. So another question that I have, and I understand and, um, 
that the average age student in a career education program at the community college level is, is in their, is it about age 28-ish? Is that true? Or yeah, well, yeah, so, um, yeah. Uh, so for us, the um, I think the mean age for our sample is 30, 31. That's at the time they earn their first credential. In our health work, we looked also at students who seem to be trying to complete a health credential, even if they never did. And I think our, our mean age there was also 29 or 30. So that, that, is, that is pretty accurate. Yeah, and so for me, I mean, just it's a comment, but as a result of the, that sort of fact, um, most of these uh, students that are in, engaged in these kinds of programs aren't coming directly from the K-12. That is correct. Right? They're not, they're not the There's a group, there, there's clearly a group of students that are coming through the, the K-12, but yeah, it's, I, 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 in the report, we, I think we do provide those distributions with more detailed age brackets, and I think the, say, 20 to 24 age group is maybe 20 or 30%, I don't, I, I'm not sure, but in the report, in the appendix, you can find a little bit more detail on that. Thank you. And then my um, a final question, sorry to be, no, no, no. I'm sorry, I'm asking a lot of questions. <laughs> But um, I, I was wondering if you said that you hadn't really linked to four-year institutions mm -hmm. per se, but I know that there's been a trend of reverse transfers back to community mm -hmm. college. So I just thought that, I don't know if you've explored that or if you even have a question on how many of these students are coming back after right. getting a four-year yes. degree. So we we do know that, and again, those are we didn't we didn't necessarily focus, but we do control for that. And so I think it's about 10, 10 to twenty percent of of the students that we do see are those that either have uh, an associate degree or a four-year degree when they come back and earn that short-term credential. So they they are a group of of the students. Um, I'll also say, in so, you know, in the very limited amount of work that's done in this space. Um, uh, another research group um, has kind of identified that as a stackable pathway. So I think they call them supplemental stacks. We didn't do that here again because we're not. We don't know anything about what they did at the four-year college. We we can observe what level they had when they when they came in, but we don't know what that was. But they they probed that question. If you and if you'd like, I can give you that information where they were explicitly looking at students who have a four-year degree and then are trying to supplement that with some career education certificate, presumably to either change occupations or advance, um, advance in their career. Thanks. I think that's all the time we have. Although, yeah, Sarah and I will both be here, um, and we're happy to kind of answer questions and talk more about the report. But thank you all very much for coming.